Welcome to lecture 23. In this lecture, we're going to go to the movies and see how plants are represented in film. Ordinarily, I'd be showing clips to you in class, but I'm going to provide a YouTube link to all the films I'm about to show. So, go grab some popcorn, and I'll see you in the movies. In the last lecture, we talked about plants in history, art, and music. In this lecture, we'll talk about plants in the movies. I've separated the plants in film into different eras, so we're going to start with the 1950s and 1960s. Perhaps one of the most famous early movies involving plants is The Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And so what you have are these plant-like creatures that produce spores that are released into space, and they fly through space, eventually to fall on planets with inhabitants. When they fall on the um, planets, they develop into these pods. And these pods eventually produce clones or lookalikes of the people that actually live on the planet. So in this case, they landed on Earth and then out of the pods emerge lookalikes of the humans that lived in this town. And so in what happens then is that these uh, pod people end up replacing the people that are real. And so uh, in this story, what you have is a doctor who sees a number of patients who think are who thinks are suffering from a delusion where they believe that their relatives have somehow been replaced with identical looking imposters but lo and behold the story ends up being true and the clip i show you shows the emergence of one of these pod people um, in a greenhouse that happened to be at a party where the doctor was present the next movie is called From Hell It Came. It's from 1957. And the premise of the story is that you have a island prince who's wrongly convicted of murder and then executed by having a knife driven into his heart. So this knife is important. We're going to come back to that. Um, but it turns out that this was all a plot of a witch doctor on the island who was the true murderer. So once the prince was executed, he was buried into a hollow tree trunk and then forgotten about, but then there's a radiation accident that reanimates the prince. But when the prince is reanimated, he's reanimated in tree-like form. So you have this horrifying killer tree that goes to set about taking revenge upon not only the witch doctor, but a lot of other people in the community that betrayed him. Um, in this scene, you can see two of his um, former lovers fighting it out, and he ends up rescuing them. Now, the knife is important because um, ultimately the villagers end up killing the prince tree-like thing because somebody ends up shooting the knife that then drives it clearly through his heart and then ends up killing the killer tree. Conga is the next story. It's from 1961. Um, this actually has a little bit more of an intrigue plot to it. So you have this British botanist who um, returns from Africa after a year. Now, during his absence, it's presumed that he's dead. And during this time, he loses a lot of scientific credibility. But during his year abroad, he learns of ways to grow plants and animals to giant size. And so he develops a serum that's able to turn uh, plants and animals giant. And so he has a pet chimpanzee whose name is Conga. And so what he does is he injects Conga with this serum and it makes Conga grow to giant gorilla size. And then he mesmerizes Conga and tricks Conga into going back and killing all of his enemies who have scientifically discredited him. And so in this clip, I, you can see Conga um, going about and taking revenge for the scientist. The next film, called Day of the Triffids from 1962, um, not only involves a little bit of botany, but also involves some political intrigue. And so what you have is these plants called triffids, which the people believe are the product of genetic engineering by the USSR. So this is a Soviet engineered plot to come and take over or take revenge upon the United States. 
The main character in the film is somebody that actually works with triffids. And triffids have this unusual oil, which can be used in industrial purposes. And so lots of places are actually growing these triffids. But what happens is, um, because the triffids are poisonous, this uh, main character gets some triffid poison in his eye and is hospitalized. Now, while he's in the hospital, there is this spectacular meteor shower that blinds and or kills most of the human population. Uh, now, once he recovers, he's told about this uh, event, and then separate little colonies are formed of humans trying to escape the attack of the triffids. And so in so doing, what happens is some of the colonies become hyper militaristic and um, they have like little wars with each other, uh, among which is a conflict in which the main character and his colony tricks the Triffids into attacking the more militaristic group. Um, uh, but the story ends with the Triffids still being on the planet. They're not able to get rid of them, but the characters are vowing to eventually free themselves from the plight of these Triffids. Let's move on to the 1970s. The next film also features a carnivorous plants, and what you have is a NASA scientist who is working on a mission um, to go to outer space, but the stress of all of the tension from developing this mission causes him to kind of have a mental breakdown. And so what happens is, is some of his colleagues in Japan then invite him to come to J Japan on a vacation. And when he goes there, he takes a Venus flytrap with him from America. Now, once he's there, he decides that he is going to pursue his hypothesis that humans actually evolved from plants. And so he then takes the Venus flytrap and he grafts it to a Japanese carnivorous oceanic plant to create this hybrid creature. And so once he's done that, um, he has to end up feeding it and it only feeds on blood. Eventually, this creature develops the ability to walk around, and that creature starts attacking all the villagers. So eventually, the doctor has to make a choice. He has to make a choice between saving the villagers or saving his creation, and he ends up choosing the villagers, and so he leads his um, attack Venus flytrap hybrid into a volcano where it eventually dies. This next film has elements not only of botany, but also of environmental activism. So this is a movie called Silent Running. It's from 1972. And the premise is that all plant life on Earth is becoming extinct. And so people gathered as many uh, plant specimens as possible and put them into giant geodesic domes, which they then attach to a spaceship called Valley Forge. And so what happens is Valley Forge leaves Earth and starts to travel towards Saturn. Now en route, the crew, the crew receives orders to destroy the domes. And so what happens is they start blowing up the domes, but when that happens, one of the scientists that's there objects. And so he objects, ends up killing part of the crew, and then taking over as many domes as he can, along with um, some robots, some drones, that are there to help with the care and um, feeding of the plants. And so he sort of befriends these drones, but eventually it all comes crashing down and he ends up having to blow up the ship and sacrifice himself to save one last um, forest dome. And there's a sort of sad parting scene where you see the drone floating away in the forest dome and it's holding this old water can that they use to water plants during the movie. This next movie is actually a little bit more controversial, and this is from 1974. It's called Mutations. The premise of the story is actually what is a little bit funny here, and that is that you have a professor who is a genetic scientist who abducts his college students and uses them as guinea pigs. He uses them as guinea pigs in experiments to crossbreed carnivorous plants with humans. And there's all kinds of descriptions of DNA and phony pseudoscience in the film, but the experiments ultimately don't satisfy 
the professor. And so he ends up giving these mutants to a cruel circus um, freak show kind of owner. And this is where it gets really controversial because a lot of people object to the depiction of these um, hybrid plant humans as um, you know ha- actually having physical disabilities. Um, but the mutants that are a part of this that the professor created are not denied justice. And so what happens is the uh, plant hybrid creatures end up going on a rampage to take revenge on the professor that created them. This last film is definitely my favorite of this 1970s era, and this is from 1978, and it's called Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. Now, this is actually a parody film that sort of capitalizes on lots of other horror films and makes jokes essentially all throughout the entire movie about them. So movies like Jaws, movies like The Birds are all in this movie in one way or another. And so the premise is um, there's an opening scene where um, a a woman is in a kitchen and she's um, doing stuff in the kitchen and then all of a sudden she hears some strange noises. Now the strange noises had emanated from this tomato that came out of her garbage disposal and crawled into a corner. And when she finds the the thing that's making the noises, she realizes it's a tomato. And then, of course, the tomato ends up going and killing her. And when the police come to investigate, they think that there's blood everywhere, but it's not blood. It ends up being tomato juice. The movie goes on and is really funny, but ends up that the tomatoes are susceptible to a certain song, which is called Puberty Love, and the tomatoes essentially shrink and retreat from this playing of this song. And so eventually everybody leads the tomatoes into a big stadium where they play the song, and the movie ends with them stomping and crushing all the tomatoes to death. Let's move on to the 1980s and 1990s. This first movie is called The Swamp Thing. It's from 1982. Now, there's a few movies called Swamp Thing, but this is the one from 1982. And it has a couple of um, protagonists in it. One is Linda and one is Alec, who happen to both be scientists. Now, Linda has developed some breakthroughs, and but Alec has actually developed this hybrid plant and animal cell, which he calls his prize discovery. Now, some other scientists get jealous and they sabotage Alec's lab. But in so doing, what happens is Alec gets coated with a mixture of Linda's discovery and his discovery, and then is transformed into the Swamp Thing. And of course, they are in love, and so he goes off to rescue Linda from the evil henchman that um, did this plot and sabotaged his lab. One of the interesting things is that in the movie, he actually ends up getting his arm removed, but he's kept in a dark space, so he can't regrow it. But eventually, light creeps into the space, and using the magic power of his meristems, he's able to grow a brand new arm, rip free, and then save Linda and save the day. This next movie is most often presented as a musical play. It's called The Little Shop of Horrors from 1986. I provide a couple of links here to you, one of which is a really famous scene that involves Steve Martin talking about becoming a dentist. And so that's not really related to plants, but if you are curious about a career in dentistry, you should watch that clip. It's really funny. The main story features a shop owner that um, ends up getting a carnivorous plant, which he bought from a Chinese flower shop during a solar eclipse. And so this plant then starts to die. But as it's dying, Seymour, who is the shop owner, accidentally pricks his finger and some blood falls onto the dying plant. When the blood falls on the dying plant, it ends up coming back. So Seymour learns that the plant, which is named Audrey II, Um, thrives on blood and as the plant grows it ends up becoming sentient and convinces Seymour to periodically bring it victims um, which he does including his 
of eventually his girlfriend, and he the plant ends up eating all of these victims, but eventually Seymour ends up getting his revenge. Now, I'm not going to spoil the end because it's quite funny, and so you should go and have a look at Little Shop of Horrors. This next film is pretty famous but a little dark. It's called The Professional. It's from 1994, and it features Leon, and Leon is a solitary hitman. He calls himself a cleaner that works for part of the mafia in New York City. And so Leon uh, goes around and uh, kills people on contract for the mob, but among the things that he really cares for in the movie is his houseplant. So he carefully cleans and preens his houseplant carrying it with him everywhere he goes. Now, eventually he befriends a young girl and the story sort of takes off from there. This movie also has a rather sad but spectacular ending, and so I won't spoil it for you. It's a good movie to watch, but maybe a little violent. Let's finish up by looking at plants that feature films in the 2000s. The first film I mention is from 2006, and that's Casino Royale where you have Daniel Craig as James Bond, and this is based on the original 1953 novel by Ian Fleming. Now, the story is pretty complicated, so I won't go into that, but part of the story involves James Bond being poisoned by atropine from Deadly Nightshade. And the clip I show you shows him dramatically getting his heart restarted by his girlfriend in the film. And you should watch that and think back to our discussion of plants as poisons. Now, I'm usually not a big fan of animated movies, but uh, WALL-E from 2008 is a great example of an animated movie that involves plants. So WALL-E is a robot, a waste allocation load lifter, Earth class, who is on Earth because all of the humans effectively poisoned their world and had to leave on a spaceship waiting for the planet to recover. And so Wally's routine is to go around when everybody is gone and basically clean up the mess that everybody um, has left behind. Now, periodically, the humans send probes back to the planet to assess whether or not it's ready to be recolonized. And so eventually what happens is another robot gets to Earth and her name is Eva. And Eva is this really powerful robot. She has lots of powerful weapons and she's a little cantankerous, but she eventually becomes enamored with Wally and um, her and Wally pal around for a little while. Now, Wally's been alone for a long time, and so he's quite infatuated with Eva and eventually convinces her to come back to where he lives, and he starts showing her lots of the different things that he's collected in his work. Now, among the things that he's collected is a plant seedling. And so in showing Eva all of his various things, he eventually shows her the plant. And when she does, it triggers this response where she then locks up and then communicates with the humans that are aboard the spaceship, telling them that life has re-emerged on planet Earth. And so it might be time to start recolonizing the planet. The story goes on from here, but suffice it to say that Wally is a great character in the film, as is Eva, and I'd encourage you to have a watch. The last film I'll talk about is from 2015, and this is The Martian, which is also based upon a novel. And so the premise of the story is that a group of astronauts travel to Mars. Um, they eventually get to Mars, but once they're there, there's a really powerful dust storm that threatens to um, destroy the vehicle that they plan to use to get back to the vehicle in orbit that'll eventually take them home. Now, in so doing, one of the astronauts, who is played by Matt Damon, ends up getting knocked out, and they end up leaving him behind. But when they leave him behind, uh, he eventually recovers himself and stitches himself up and lives inside these geodesic domes. In so doing, he has to figure out a way to feed himself because it's going to take a long time for the ship to come back in order to get him home. 
In so doing, he discovers that he has lots and lots and lots of potatoes. And so he takes these potatoes and he chops them up very carefully, making sure that he has an eye of each potato in that section that he's chopped up to plant in the ground. In so doing, he grows this fabulous uh, potato crop um, and has to employ a bunch of tricks, one of which almost blows himself up, but he eventually grows enough potatoes to keep himself alive to eventually get back. Now, I won't uh, spoil all of the fun parts in the film, but it's definitely a great film to watch and very scientifically accurate, not just in terms of the botany, but also in terms of the rest of the science. I hope that lecture gave you some insight into how plants are represented in film. If you have a favorite that wasn't shown, please send me an email. I'm always eager to add more to my collection. And thank you so much for all the hard work you've put in this quarter. It really shows, and I can tell that many of you have learned a lot about plants. Once campus reopens, you're always welcome to come say hello. I'd love to meet you in person. Thanks, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.